Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm very pleased to be joined by Michelle Robson. Michelle is an investor, one of the most senior investors uh, in hydrogen technology. She works for AP Ventures, who have been a leading uh, force uh, in the in the in the world of of uh, investing in in technology and specifically hydrogen technology and indeed its derivatives, which is primarily what we're going to talk about today. So, welcome, Michelle. Thanks very much. Nice to nice to be here today talking with you, Nadim. Yeah. So we've spoken a number of times, I think, over the past sort of four or five years. AP Ventures, for those that don't know, has a long track, the longest track record. I think it's, it's fair to say you're, you're one of the, the first um, people to take hydrogen and its derivatives seriously and start looking at investing in in um, key technology um, that, that's applicable across across the value chain. A whole host of names have, uh, have received your your funds uh, from Ballard and Hydrogenius, um, Hyatt, Amogy, um Hydrogen, uh, United Hydrogen, Zero Avia, Infinium, uh, the list is endless. I, I'm, I'm, I probably missed some other big names as well. Um, but, Very um, well done. You got the highlight. Yeah. <laughs> but the, um, you're going to be speaking at the World Hydrogen Congress again, or, or World Hydrogen Derivatives, which is the, the first sort of two days of what is now World Hydrogen Week. So that's um, October the 9th to the 13th. You're in, in the keynote session looking at this big picture around derivatives. So maybe... For those not familiar or haven't been tracking the derivatives market, um, what, what what are you seeing? Uh, you know, what did you see when you invested in in those um, derivatives companies um, uh, about the market, and and why are derivatives important for for unlocking, um, I guess, hydrogen's impact on, on on decarbonization? That's not too big an ask. Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, no, it's a, thanks very much. It's a it's a big question. So uh, maybe I'll give a high level answer and we can dive into it and in, into the areas that you want to go a bit deeper on. But um, for a long time, we've been a, a large believer in the midstream. And in the beginning, that was driven by the understanding that um, the, the demand centres for where hydrogen was going to be most valued, so where you have your industrial requirements, where you have heat requirements, um, are oftentimes the same areas where it is very, very expensive to produce hydrogen, particularly from renewable sources or low carbon sources. So, um, you know, Northern Europe, um, Asia, for instance, parts of the US. So um, the areas where it is cheapest to produce that hydrogen um, are areas where you have abundant sunshine, you've got um, sun during the day, wind blowing at night. And those places tend to be in places where industry isn't. So that's the west coast of Australia, the north coast of Africa, um, south coast of Africa. So we saw this both uh, a gap in terms of the market, but also in terms of geography. And it was our view, our hypothesis, that you would require these what we now call derivatives to be able to um, cross the gap um, and address that challenge. So effectively being able to transport large volumes of low carbon hydrogen from where it's being produced to the demand centers and being able to do that safely, you know, cheaply and efficiently. Yeah. And so and so that's really what drove us towards um, investing uh, across the derivative space. Yeah. So, I mean, in essence, trying to replicate what we have today, where, where you have a huge amount of energy imported into into northern Europe, um, you know, mainly obviously in the, in, in the role of sort of fossil fuels and, and methane and, and oil um, and, and trying to replicate that with the, with the clean energy system, I think is, is what you're saying. And, and in terms of those those derivatives, um, we've seen a lot of interest across, I guess, the, the, the three main groupings, if, if it were in terms of ammonia methanol and lohc and um i see you've invested in virtually well you know certainly in ammonia and, and lohc to date what 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 is the sort of i guess value and we've seen a lot of noise around or a lot of noise but a lot of um interest in in ammonia and, and uh indeed uh, methanol now with um maritime shipping seeming to to take a strong lead in 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 interest in dual fuel um maritime ships uh, and indeed, it was seeing uh, good good uh, announcements around the LOHC space. So, what it is, um, what what are they getting uh, a lot of interest? Uh, what do you think specifically driving that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, in the beginning, our investments were on LOHC and in ammonia were predicated on them being a carrier. Mm. So, very much around, yeah, it's it's addressing that gap in the midstream and really just. The, our concept originally was, 
you have you start with gaseous hydrogen, you transform it into the, the derivative to the ammonia or to the LOHC. And at the end of its journey, you convert it back into gaseous hydrogen and you use it in your, you know, to decarbonize an industrial process or to provide some heat for industrial applications. So that was our first, uh, our first thesis. What's, what's developed since then is actually the value of the derivative in and of itself. And what I mean by that is we now see markets developing for low carbon ammonia, which are completely independent of the application of it being a carrier. And so um, we have obviously new segments for those for those derivatives. So we've got, you know, Asia looking at using ammonia in power. We've got um, shippers all over the world looking at ammonia as a long distance shipping fuel. We have the same thing uh, happening for LOHC as well, where people are looking at it for a um, an alternative of fossil fuels in the maritime space. So so there are markets developing that are there um, that, that this derivative can sell into in addition to its hydrogen piece. Additionally, for some of these derivatives, and, and actually I include things like e-fuels in there, for some of these derivatives, there are markets there today that they can sell into. Now, you may not necessarily get as high a premium, but there are there's an existing ammonia market. There's obviously an existing aviation market. And so I think what's really driving the interest now in derivatives is in addition to its role as a carrier and a decarbonisation agent, it is now um, a decarbonisation agent in its own right for existing markets. Yeah. And so that gives investors something to hook onto today because there are obviously markets that they can, you know, that they, they can um, look to to get a return on their investment today. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense, I guess, um, because it's, you know, c- keeping it in its form. So specifically ammonia. Yeah, ammonia is a. I, I can't remember the number now, but it, um, certainly seventy to to hundred million dollar, hundred million tons market, is it not? And we're seeing some of the players like OCI. We, we spoke to them recently, who are also going to be speaking at, at the Congress, and their their own internal mandate is to decarbonize. I think it was twenty percent of their operations um, by by pretty short order, and and, and they trade around about ten percent of the, of the ammonia trade in the world today. So, just decarbonizing the ammonia market is 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 viable now and and i think um obviously seeing uh quite a big impact on on the, the fertilizer market from the from the ukraine war and, and so that also i guess has provided an opportunity for people to to maybe see some territory in in the ammonia value chain um specifically by by new forms of, of creating i obviously green ammonia um, so yeah, I guess that, that's what uh, is a very valid point, and and that will then help, I guess, stimulate um, further further uses of of when people are looking at uncracking ammonia. Is that yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's something like twenty million tons uh, presently are traded uh, or shipped. Sorry, of ammonia. Most of it is most of it that's produced is used across the across the fence. But you've got a you do have a basis to start from, um, and albeit small, that's always really really helpful. Um, so so we are yeah quite quite optimistic. Um, we also see obviously similar developments happening in the methanol space. Methanol, by contrast, it's a it's a smaller market, but there's a there's a big demand for it. So mm-hmm. you see a lot of focus in in that space on um, new technologies uh, developing green methanol solutions. And then in the synthetic fuel space, um, you know, synthetic fuels, there's a range of different ways that you can address the, um, you know, the SAF requirements, particularly that those that we see coming out of Europe, where there's a heavy incentive towards, you know, blending some um, yeah, non-fossil based SAF. Uh, and, and so that's just creating a market there for um, for those new technology developers as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've seen obviously the the EU, um, the, the SAF uh, oh, sorry, the non-biological SAF component of that new um, legislation. And, and that's, for me, I think the first um, actual e-fuels market that is compliance in terms of actually uh, you know, having to produce, uh, I can't remember the exact quantities, but they're sort of a, a 0.5% from 2030. I can't remember, you, you, you will know better than me. Um, but also, and also, there's a blending market in Germany as well. What, I can't remember the details for that either, but I guess there's some quantities there. Yeah, that's right. So there's a blending market in Germany. It's a little bit more, um, uh, you know, it, it provides, I suppose, more of that stick, um, which or, or and 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 more of the, the the carrot, if you will, as well. So 
um, you know, the, the subsidies there um, are very, very helpful for developers because it means that, you know, they have the um, the market pulling you in, uh, which is which is great. I suppose on the other side, you know, of the Atlantic, we've spoken lots about the IRA, but the advantages that you have there is, you know, the ability to be able to produce these saps, this ammonia, these methanols at a lower cost. So being able to perhaps produce in one jurisdiction, trade in another jurisdiction, these kinds of things are what investors are looking at today. Uh, and it's, it's fantastic because it, it enables you to make the, the maths add up and it enables you to get a project off the ground. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think it exa- exactly the same happened back in the old um, biodiesel market and people were shipping, you know, um, biodiesel from or, or soya from Argentina to America to blend it there to pick up the carrot and then take it to the stick market of the of the, of the EU. Um but yeah, certainly they are um, useful bits of legislation for helping scale industry. Um, and hopefully that that is what's going to happen in terms of that sort of scaling industry. And, um, you know, there are there are still lots of challenges in terms of, of technology. And some of this technology is is nation. And and again, it famously happened in, in, in the second generation biofuels market, the, the famous sort of valley of death in the middle of America, because you, you had your West Coast venture capital that were trying to unlock some of those 2G technologies, and you had your East Coast investment bankers happy to, to spend money on the second or third um, infrastructure project. But there's there's that gap, that's that famous sort of scaling technology gap. How, how are we going to overcome that in 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 hydrogen or its derivatives and 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 clearly that's that's something you, you've thought about because that is the challenge around scaling and innovation in energy is 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 it's it's physical it's it it, it takes a lot of capital um to do that it, it isn't you know um it sector and, and google required comparatively little to, to to scale its business to ipo so what, what are some of your thoughts around that sort of overcoming the valley of death yeah, it's a really good point and something that we think about a lot. Um, I guess I have a couple of observations on it, um, one of which is, you know, many of our portfolio companies are now coming to the point where they are embarking on their first commercial commercial project. Um, the, the challenge that you run into is for most project developers, not all of them, but most of them, when you speak with them, they want, they want off-the-shelf tech. They don't want to take any tech risk. And this is because the investors are saying to them, we don't want to take any tech risk. That, though, is challenging. Because while your solar panels and to some extent your wind turbines and even some to some extent your batteries have, you know, there's very little incremental um, cost reduction left in terms of, you know, how costs are scaling down. Um, for electrolyzers, it's very much the other way around. So electrolyzer prices today are high, but as volumes ramp up, as they become mass produced, you're going to see electrolyzer costs fall quite dramatically. The implications are for a project developer, if you lock in a technology choice today, for instance, of current technology, current alkaline technology, you're locking in a cost point. And the project has to, you know, you're going to amortize that over the life of the project, be that 10 or 20 years. And so at some point, you know, within the next five years, potentially earlier, there's going to be new electrolyzer technology that comes along, which is going to be significantly lower cost than your electrolyzer technology. And that's a real problem that you know, projects and their financiers have faced. Things like uh, the IRA and other subsidies similar to that really help because what they do is they provide a subsidy that lasts for a set period of time, which really incentivizes projects to come online today. And so it ensures that it what it tries to do is minimize that gap between the project that's being developed today and maybe the, the cost of the project that's going to be developed in five years' time. So if you're an investor, you are no worse off by, um, you know, by, by financing that project today. Um, so I think those kinds of subsidies are going to be extremely helpful. Uh, we welcome what we've seen in the US and we would like to see, you know, similar kinds of frameworks rolled out across the globe to be able to help project developers um, bring those projects t- to market. Yeah. And, I mean, are you, are you beginning to see that? I mean, there seems to be an era now of... of- a lot more sort of public support, people looking to attract value chains and sort of regional development aid and 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 I guess more sort of localized finance, if that's the right term. But um, but yeah, are you are you seeing some specific opportunities or your clients where they can um you know scale with with other forms of, of, of government or public support? Yeah, I mean there's lot there is there is quite a bit in place. Um 
uh, some of the opportunities in the EU on, on paper are uh, really, you know, they're fantastic opportunities, but the process is, um, it takes a long time. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of administrative burd- burdens and a lot of administrative hurdles to go through. There's a lot of layers of delegation decision-making that you have to pass through. And so while probably when we talked maybe 18 months ago, I would have said that the EU was leading in this respect, I would actually say that they're really falling behind. Um, a lot of the projects that should have been approved in the last, you know, two years ago are still waiting to get that sign off. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's that's really disappointing, both from the point of view of as an investor, but just as a, from a point of view of the energy transition. You know, we, we can't afford more delays. Yeah. Um, we see this, you know, every day in terms of the severity of the weather events that we're facing now. Um, so, you know, we we hope that, uh, a lot of this bureaucracy, a lot of this red tape is is going to be removed to enable these projects to, to you know to to come to fruition as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah, and certainly, I guess the, the US is, is is certainly taking the lead with the IRA. Is, is there, from an investor standpoint, are, are, are there concerns around that that scenario in terms of uh, obviously a a change in government happening and and um you know we're, we're seeing an extension of i guess the culture war to esg and 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 certainly also even in, even in the uk to a certain extent um are there concerns for some of that long-term capital around that sort of political situation again look i think it's 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 something that you can't discount absolutely but what i would say is that um uh you know the energy transition is now no longer just about um climate change it's also about energy resilience hmm. and so there are a multitude of very good reasons why people on both sides of the house are going to want to see the energy transition take place because it also offers a much more secure position on which to base your own energy um, uh, inputs as well as obviously your industry as well. So um, we are hopeful that a change in administration wouldn't necessarily dial back, you know, the substance of what we've seen in the US. Yeah, gotcha. Excellent. Well, Michelle, fascinating to talk to you as ever. Thanks a lot uh, for taking the time out. I know it's been very busy. Any any final comments around the the the, the, the football uh, World Cup and 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 your your team's great performance in getting to the semi final? <laughs> yeah, well, some very very disappointed people back home. I have to say, yeah. um, but you know, I think um, I think football has been the winner. So yeah. uh, I know the Australians going to continue to be watching and supporting football from now on, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Good. I had to get that in. I'm still bitter about losing the cricket, but anyway, <laughs> look, forward to, look forward to seeing you in October. Yeah, you too. Thanks very yeah. much. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye.